I'll give a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Pablo. Uh, I'm Chinese. <laughs> I was exchange in Spain and uh, they worked in Argentina for two years. So, yeah, I just used the Spanish name. Uh, yeah, I'm a contributor from PlankDAO involved in the Web3 industry for like four or five, five years. Yeah, nearly five years. Okay, so today our topic is regarding the Dig Nomad and the network state. Uh, yeah, honestly speaking, when we say Dig Nomad, I think we more focused on the Web3 Dig Nomads or we call Crypto Nomads. Uh, I think we already know our, <laughs> our guests very well. So we can start with uh, the question. Uh, so the first question I received from Garfi, so he actually gave me nine questions, uh, but I don't think we, we need to go through all of them. <laughs> so I just pick up something I, I think which was interesting. So let's start from a general question. Is, uh, the question, how has the rise of crypto, like cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technology impact the lifestyle of digital nomads? Maybe we can start from Maui, because yellow, you have lots of like crypto, crypto nomads, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think first and foremost, it opens up um, a lot of education opportunities for people to learn about blockchain. Um, it opens up um, career opportunities as well. And of course, um, cryptocurrency being decentralized and borderless, um, just digital nomads basically have an easier time to um, to I guess use um, cryptocurrency as a mode of payment or um, as a mode of um, trans uh, exchanging currencies mm -hmm. um, across borders. Uh, actually, I'm more curious because someone told me it's illegal to like do the payment in crypto in Thailand. Is that is that true? I mean, I mean formally. As a merchant, like you cannot receive the crypto as the way of the. I think there are very few um, companies or entities here in Thailand that you, that accepts crypto as a payment. Um, but there are a few. Uh, okay. So it's rumor. <laughs> yeah, outside Thailand, I think is a lot more acceptable. Um, but even in Thailand, there are um, exchanges that um, allow people, especially locals, to trade crypto. Oh, that's good because you know we as Chinese we are kind of web three refugees. We just run out from China, which is totally banned, regulated. So yeah, it's good to know Thailand allows that at least. Michelle, um, <coughs> yes, I <coughs> sorry. Um, so I, I think we have a bit of a problem with uh, uh, digital nomadism, which is that. So if you're European or Australian or even American and you leave your country. Um, after a while, people cut you out. So, like for example, in Belgium, we have a very good social security system. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I was here for one year, they told me, uh, "Well, okay, you know, you don't live here anymore, so you lose your benefits." And then you were here in Thailand, but Thailand has very strict laws against working. So basically, they push a lot of people in the illeg illegality um, because you're you're actually working, but you're not allowed, not allowed to work, right? Yeah. And so I it's in this gap that I think that the crypto comes in as a, as a lifeline um, because it allows many people to make a living outside of the state-based um, rules. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a good thing, but it's just a reality that <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of a people point. are facing. So the um, so I, you know, I just want to, I think this is important. So when Bitcoin was invented or engineered, whatever you want to call it. And it pub published in P2P it Foundation. It was the first, yeah, yeah. It was the actually, yeah, on my site where it was um, mentioned first. Um, so it was the first socially sovereign currency that scaled globally, right? We have thousands of complementary currencies which work locally and they are never really successful you know they use usually have a few hundred members but the first currency that was recognized by a global community that was outside the state was actually bitcoin so i think in that sense you know it's it's kind of a harbinger of a new way of organizing uh, ourselves and i i think digital nomads should seriously think about the concept of guilds and i i know it's already happening but you know that was like 
in the Middle Ages, when you lived in Europe or maybe in the Islamic world, um, that's how people organized themselves. So, you know, trans locally, they had guilds. And if you were a guild member, you could actually travel around Europe or travel around the Islamic world. And you had halfway houses uh, that accepted you. And I think in many ways, you know, what you're doing here is a bit similar. Maybe you don't use the same language, but you're creating infrastructures that allow people to move around and to have a place and an identity, even if they're not in their in their locality. Yeah, it sounds like a like a DAO member in a DAO, like a guild member in a guild. That's that's the exact I think what forces you doing to building the nomad base over the world. Uh, okay, so so next interesting question is. Uh, how can digital nomads, uh, nomads maintain a sense of community and a connection with other crypto nomads despite their physical distance? Like, it's, I think it's, it's kind of a general question for the digital nomads. Uh, but compared with a remote working a company, uh, so s remotely worked uh, DAO members, because they, they, they are kind of, yeah, I, I, should, not, I should not say they are, they are totally decentralized because I think yeah, part of job still were centralized, but the still it's very really different from a traditional company. So, yeah, how do they maintain the connection, the sense of community? I'll, I'll start. Want to go for it? Yeah. So, um, uh, this is a bit of a social theory, but it's called uh, object-oriented uh, sociality. And so, basically, the idea is that. You know what what binds you together, right? Like if you live in a tribe, it was your family, it was kinship, it was blood, clan. So you had like a unity around your family, and then we invented empire, and it became these religions. It's because you all believe in the same god that you can trust each other. Um, then we had a nation state. You're all citizens of the same country. But I think with, with digital nomads, is it's really what are you making together? Like, so there is this kind of social thing that you're building, constructing together, and that gives you an ide a partial identity. Like, we are doing Linux together, we are doing Ethereum together. And, and so it's, you, you create another layer of identity based on your contributions. I, I, I am what I am because I contribute to this community in addition to having other identity uh, markers. And so I think, you know, it's creating, we need human beings something outside of themselves. We can't just be happy on our own. We, we, we need something collective. And I think in the digital nomad world, it's your common projects that create that. Yeah, so I agree, I agree with him, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, it works that everyone has a common goal, um, which is to develop lo the blockchain technology. Um, Telegram, I guess, is one of the uh, best friends of crypto users simply because of um, the encryption of the messaging app. Um, but I think there's just a lot of um, countries right now that are growing in terms of the people who are involved in um, developing you know blockchain um, so it's not easy to find the community wherever you travel um, there are lots of um, a lot of events and conferences that you can attend to and just find more connections get to learn um, learn more about what other projects are doing and what's new and yeah just growing your network yeah, I think the biggest problem is probably identity because if we, we, we evolved into network state, we probably lose our uh, old identity as a nation state. In a nation state, at least, I, like, I recognize myself almost like 100% Chinese. And uh, someone like Ika is half Japanese, but I, I think she, she recognized herself more like a Thai people. But you, you won't change that after you are born. But like a network state, you can you can easily like transist to, to change your identity in, in different network state, and uh, yeah, I think you will kind of lose your maybe sense of identity. Yeah, it could be a problem in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, this this question I think uh, it's my personal interest in which is dear to me because I'm new to Thailand and I probably live here. I will travel to here frequently, so this is about uh, what's the like 
uh, what are the key considerations for the nomad when it comes to tax regulation and the finance? But actually, my, my, my personal interest in how the tax here regarding the uh, crypto in Thailand, maybe. <laughs> I actually don't know a lot about the tax regulations here as well. Okay, so that's the answer because you, you <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind um, of answer. It's, it's not important, right, people? <laughs> but for me, I think the, the important thing for me was to take care of Visa um, when, I, when I decided that I wanted to stay here. Um, I'm also Chinese, by the way. I've been uh, living in Thailand for close to five years. Um, but once you get the Visa thing figured out, it's quite easy to just stay here and work. Mm -hmm. And Michel, uh, I know you, you, you are running our professional foundation, so part of donation is should it be cryptos, right? Yes. Like how you process uh, that, or it's totally OTC? No, unfortunately, um, our money was stolen uh, in the Mount Gox affair, and so basically <laughs> we, okay. didn't, we didn't uh, reorganize ourselves after that, so... Um, yeah, I. So I'm also not very aware of Thai tax law. I, I'm. You know, I've been living here for 20 years, and I never had a permanent visa. So it's it's a very pragmatic country. They, you know, just find ways. <laughs> and yeah. I don't want to explain in detail, but uh, it's. Um, yeah. yeah, it's I it's yeah. not it's not a country. I mean, as a European, you know, we, we have trouble with this because we come from a very highly organized societies with lots of regulations. And, and of course, here it's a, a bit different. And for us, it gives us a sense of freedom that we don't have uh, in our own country. Um, but, you know, it also has drawbacks, which is like, you know, not necessarily know what, what the rule is in a particular context. So I, I think one of the recommendation is you, you really need to know Thai people if you live here uh, to help you when you have any issues. And most of the issues you can, you know, through friendliness and connections with g going to the right places, you know, they usually solve it in some pragmatic way. But it's, it's yeah, I think it's a good recommendation. I, I'm married, so I don't have the problem. <laughs> but, uh, you know... Get get to know Thai people and get, which is not so easy. Yeah, they so Thai people are very very friendly, but they also put you in a box, right? You're you're a farang, so I don't know exactly how they do with Chinese people, but certainly if you're Same. Westerners, they you're, you're very friendly, very hospitable, but at the same time, it's very clear you're not one of them. And you know, I I made peace with that, and I'm married, so I'm I'm integrated in Thai society through my family. But I still, after 20 years, I don't have many Thai friends. It's very difficult to, to do that. <laughs> okay, I, I think it's actually give the answer. As crypto man, like most of us don't give a shit to the tax regulation, at least so far, <laughs> before they regulate us. Uh, okay, yeah, let's give the, l let's choose the last question. Yes, uh, yeah, maybe can share any interesting or like success story of Thai nomad, crypto nomads who like leverage the crypto technology to do something, to build their successful careers or project, anything, anything interesting you can come up? <laughs> yeah, I can talk about Yellow, more Ooh, about yeah. Yellow. Um, so Alexis, our founder, um, was very successful in terms of co-founding GSR. This was back in 2013. Um, but Alexis um, soon founded Yellow. I think it was around 2017, 2018. And he came to Chiang Mai. He envisioned uh, uh, Chiang Mai as a very digital nomad friendly space. Um, and he wanted to build a community there by, uh, with blockchain technology. Um, so he created Yellow, opened the co working space. Um, we incubated a bunch of projects who worked in, um, in the office. And just after five years, um, I can say that we've managed to establish a good footprint here in uh, Chiang Mai as a community for Web3 projects. So just to see the growth of Yellow within the five years has been um, tremendous. It's opened up a lot of opportunities and um, yeah, expanded our network, met a lot of people, good and bad. <laughs> cool, but by the way, I, I sure.
Um, from my experience in Yellow, it's crypto secondary markets. It's all about um, crypto cycles. Um, I'm pretty much learning about this myself. Alexis is, I would say, a veteran in this area. Um, so it, there's always going to be a bull market, a bear, bear market. Um, but for us, um, we focus on developing our technology, um, especially during the bear market. And right now, we're more focused in investing and preparing for the next bull run. COVID was a difficult time. Um, if, if there was any struggle in building a community here, it was definitely the COVID season. Um, yeah, I mean, Yellow co-working space, I think, opened right before COVID hit uh, Chiang Mai. So you can imagine the first year being very slow. There was not a lot of people. Um, of course, uh, everyone is avoiding uh, co-working spaces. A lot of farangs, a lot of, like, um, people from other countries, you know, there was a lot of paranoia as well as, you know, for health reasons as well. Um, but yeah, I think over time, you know, the community just grew organically. Um, we're getting a lot of projects coming into yellow, um, a lot of digital nomads coming into yellow every day. So I think the community is still growing, yeah. By the way, I was a customer of GSA in, in bull market. Yeah, I may, maybe the safety yellow during COVID. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Michelle, you have something? I just want to tell you an anecdote that maybe some of you don't know. But if you draw a circle around Chiang Mai, and I forget if it's 1,000 kilometers or 1,000 miles, you have 1 billion people. We're right in the middle of 1 billion people. Uh, and, uh, you know, I. Uh, I think that's uh, something good to know because China, India, Philippines, Indonesia, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, it's all within 1,000 miles, I think, around Chiang Mai. So th this is a very dynamic place. It's, um, you know, and it's, it's capacity to absorb people and ideas. It's, uh, it's remarkable, actually. I don't think there are many places in the world like this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm from Shanghai, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have one million people in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's in, in Asia, it's, it's, it's very different yeah, from Europe. Okay, uh, thanks for our guests for coming, joining our panel.